Going back, oh my God, how many accolades, how many feathers in your, cat, in your hat after a wonderful long life, you know, a veteran of Korea, Griffiths Air Force Base, teaching sports with the paper, the OD, and then moving up the ladder and editor, and, and the, the one most wonderful thing the last years is your, your memories, the column you write, and you have a wonderful, wonderful expanse of experience and knowledge and history. And uh, I thought it would be good to have Mr. Tremano, who was history mister, in October because we celebrate a lot of historical things. October was the month when Bishop Scalabrini was made a saint at the Vatican. So now, instead of calling it the Scalabrini Center, we call it the Saint Scalabrini Center. Wonderful, wonderful. The Saint Scalabrini Center, and in there, in that building, of course, is the Salerno Room, which is on the Sesta Block. Block. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'll be lucky if they name a buck house after me. So, Mr. Tomato, let's hear it again as we welcome him to the microphone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Father, and uh, I want to thank everyone for inviting me here. I, boy, what a crowd. It's, 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 uh, it's great. And I want to thank the Father for that wonderful introduction. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful day for a communion brunch, I guess we call it. And it's a beautiful day because, uh, in, my, in my opinion, um, the Buffalo Bills have a a bye week, so uh, they're not on television today, so we're not missing a Buffalo Bill football game. <laughs> well, you can't beat that, so everything's, everything's going our way. Anyway, uh, Father mentioned um, uh, uh, Bishop Scalabrini, and I'm, you know, I was wondering if, um, how many parents today of newborn sons name their sons John. I wonder if John is still a popular name. So many names like my name, Frank Francis, isn't that popular anymore. But I, I hope John continues to be a popular name because the name John is a very important name in the history of the Catholic Church. There's, of course, John the Baptist. There's the evangelical St. John, the Apostle. And more popes have taken the name John than any other name. Twenty-two of them. Beginning with uh, Pope John I, of course, in the year 523. And the last being Pope John Paul II from 1978 to, the, to when he died in 2005. So now you're probably wondering, um, well that's interesting that the name John is important in the history of the Catholic Church, so, so what, you know? Well, this afternoon I briefly want to talk about two men named John who um, are a part of the history of St. Mary of Mount Carmel, Blessed Sacrament Parish, and, and their history. Both had important roles in the history of the Church, one direct and one indirect way. <clears throat> And I'm going to start with, um, with the man that uh, Father talked about, Bishop John Giovanni Baptista Scalabrini. Uh, from 1876 to his death in 1905, uh, he was bishop of a diocese in northern Italy with nearly 400 parishes, if you, if you could believe that. And he, and he also, among other things, was the founder of, as I'm sure you know, the Scalabrini, uh, Scalabrini um, uh, Fathers. Now from the 1890s to the late 1980s and early 1990s, nearly a hundred years, uh, as you know, these, the Scalabrini Fathers, these missionaries from, uh, from, from Italy, served St. Mary of Mount Carmel Church until I believe 19, 91 when priests from the Syracuse Diocese took over 
the first being Father uh, Joseph Salerno. The second man named John I want to talk about is John C. Devereux, uh, a native of Ireland who left during the rebellion there in 1799 and eventually uh, moved to Utica in 1802. Uh, he opened a general store on Bag Square and eventually was one of the founders of the Savings Bank of Utica, the bank with the gold dome. He also was a devout Catholic, and he founded, in 1819, St. John's Church in Utica. He was one of the co-founders. Um, in turn, St. John's Church, at that time, mostly Irish parishioners, played an important role in the establishment of St. Mary of Mount Carmel Church. And I'm going to begin with Bishop, now Saint, uh, John Giovanni Scalabrini. Between 1890 and when he died in 1905, um, more than four million Italians left Italy, settled in the United States. Between 1890, I'm sorry, between 1880 and the 1920s, more than four million Italians left Italy and settled in the United States, most of them in the New York City, New Jersey area, and many, as you know, in upstate New York. Now, at the same time, a large number left Italy and settled in South America, Brazil and Argentina. My paternal grandfather left Italy in 1895 and settled in Argentina, worked in uh, a railroad there, and then eventually moved to Utica. Now in Utica, those Italian immigrants, um, together with uh, immigrants from places like Poland and Russia, um, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, caused the population of Utica to explode between the mid-1880s and 1930. As an example, in 1880, the population of Utica was 34,000. Ten years later, in 1890, it was uh, 44,000. Ten years later, in 1900, it was 56,000. In 1910, it was 76,000. In uh, 1920, 94,000. In 1930, 101,000. The population of Utica, they were moving on up. And in other words, from 1880, to 1930, the population of Utica increased by 67,000 people. Unbelievable. Now, the Italian immigrants, most of them from southern Italy, uh, began coming to Utica in large numbers in the mid-1880s. And why not? There were jobs here. Now, the West Shore Railroad uh, was being built. Uh, it started in New York City and proceeded uh, west and north along the west shore of the Hudson River to Albany, and then from Albany west along the Mohawk River, the Mohawk Valley, to places like Schenectady and Amsterdam, Herkimer, Utica, and eventually Syracuse. Um, and so the, and the West Shore Railroad needed jobs, uh, needed workers. They had plenty of jobs for workers, especially for the new immigrants coming in. Uh, Utica had a lot of jobs. Uh, many of the uh, brickyards along North Genesee Street needed workers. So did the knitting mills. Not only knitting mills in West Utica, but the knitting mills along Broad Street in Utica, the Oneida, the Mohawk, the Scenandoa, the Augusta. They all needed workers. Now the majority of early immigrants that came, that, that came to this country were really struggling to survive. It was a new land, strange, um, a strange, unfamiliar language, unfamiliar dress, unfamiliar food, unfamiliar music, unfamiliar, unfamiliar customs, everything. And they had no church of their own. The, uh, the ones that did go, the Catholics that did go to church went to St. John's Church. Uh, but they did not understand the sermon, which was in English, 
And the ones that did go to confession were having a difficult time because of the, the language barrier. And to make matters worse, the Italian government, unlike governments in Germany, England, Ireland, and Russia, the Italian government did nothing, nothing at all to, get, to help the Italian immigrants in, the, in, in, in this country. Um, and this angered Bishop Scalabrini. He was a bit of a rebel. And, um, and, uh, and he, he decided, and he, he was not only a doer, uh, not only a talker, he was a doer, and he decided to do something about it. And this is when he formed the Scalabrini Fathers. Missionary priests who were willing to leave their families and their homes and their churches in Italy and move to America to administer to the Italian immigrants here. Now in Utica they eventually began to uh, um, uh, serve parishioners at uh, St. Mary of Mars Carmel Church. Um, I know when, when, uh, when I was growing up, uh, a parishioner of St. Mary of Mars Carmel, um, my pastor, believe it or not, was Father Mark of John, and then Father Pozzolio, Father Burton, I'm sure you remember many of those names, all Scalabrini, Scalabrini fathers. Now in 1901, Pope Leo XIII asked Bishop Scalabrini to visit the United States and to get a first-hand look at the Italian immigrants, how they were doing in this new country. What, you know, what did they need? Now, Bishop Scalabrini had a busy schedule in America, of course, uh, but he accepted an invitation by parishioners, this is 1901, by parishioners of the then five-year-old Mount Carmel Church uh, to visit the church during upcoming, upcoming uh, cornerstone laying ceremony uh, for their new church being built in East Utica, west of Mohawk Street, between Jay and Catherine, as you know. Now the basement of the church had been completed and the holy sacrifice of the mass celebrated there since 1896. Now it was time to complete the upper church. And uh, as the cornerstone would be laid on a Sunday afternoon on September 15, 1901. Now that Sunday morning, Bishop Scalabrini was in Syracuse at St. Peter's Church, a church like St. Mary of Mount Carmel, dominated by Italian immigrants. And he also, while he was there, confirmed a large number of youngsters. Then he left by train for Utica um, and was greeted in the early afternoon at the train depot on Main Street by a carriage uh, with parishioners from St. Mary of Mar Carmel Church. It took, him, it took him to the site on J Street where the cornerstone for the upper section of the church would be placed. Now a parade had been scheduled to greet the bishop at the train depot from Bag Square to J Street, but was canceled because of the death the day before of President William McKinley, who died on September 14, 1901. And I think, as you know, the president was the victim of, a, of an assassin's bullet. A large reception had also been scheduled uh, to, for the bishop but that was, um, that was reduced to a smaller get-together because of the death of President McKinley. So at 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon, September 15, 1901, a Sunday, the cornerstone lay in so ceremony began. And a large crowd gathered at Mohawk and Jay. There were a, my, uh, I, I, I went to the library and checked the newspaper on September 15. There was quite an article and there were hundreds of hundreds of people on the, in the corner of Mohawk and Jay to witness what was a pretty historic event. Uh, and the ceremony was led by Bishop Scalabrini, who was assisted by a father, um, McGraw from, from uh, Clayville, a father, Slavin from Weisbro, and a Monsignor James Lynch, who was the rector of St. John's Church in Utica. Now, Bishop Scalabrini approached the cornerstone 
and placed in it a box. And in that box was an image, a medal with the image of the bishop, a copy of the Saturday Globe newspaper, which described the death of President McKinley the day before. And there was a statement written in Latin by Bishop Scalabrini uh, describing the cornerstone land ceremony and that he indeed had blessed and laid the cornerstone. Before he left Utica, by the way, he was made a member of the, uh, of the Society of uh, Mount Carmel, of Mount Carmel, the oldest society, I guess, in the church organized in the 1890s. And just before I leave uh, Bishop Scalabrini, I'm, I'm sure most of you know that his visit to Utica in 1901, in my opinion anyway, makes St. Mary of Mount Carmel's Blessed Sacrament Parish a bit more historic than it, than it is. Because in 1997, as you know, Pope John, uh, John Paul II beatified uh, a Bishop Scalabrini, and earlier this month, I believe on October 9th, uh, Pope France declared him a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. You know, um, I really think that's something that all Uticans, not only Catholics, all Uticans, should really be proud of. Uh, the fact that the fact, uh, his affiliation with St. Mary of Mount Carmel Blessed Sacrament Parish. So now Utica really has two saints, St. Mary Ann Cope from St. Joseph St. Patrick Church in West Utica, and now in East Utica, we have St. John Scalabrini, who blessed and laid the cornerstone for, um, uh, for our church. So that's something I think all Uticans should be proud of. And just as an aside, I still don't think we do enough. Uh, we should be so proud of St. Mary Ann Cope and now St. John uh, Scalabrini. Most Uticans, I guess, um, I've just forgotten it, other than, other than uh, St. Joseph, St. Patrick's Church, and now St. Mary Mark Carmel. These two persons who are saints in the Catholic Church, and I think there's only seven or eight American saints, and now two of them uh, are connected with uh, Utica. I think you know, that's something we should be proud of. Now the second man I want to talk about, named John, is uh, John Korsh. Devereux. He was born in Ireland in 1774 of French and Irish stock. Uh, he, spent, uh, he spent years in France learning, uh, studying dance and the violin. And he moved to New England in the early 1790s and believe it or not made a very, very good living teaching dance and, and, and the violin. So in 1802, he decided to move to the fast-growing village of, of Utica and quickly discovered that the hard-working pioneers in Utica, this is in the early 1802, they loved to dance, they loved their violin music, but they were not willing to spend the little money they had on lessons. So the ambitious John C. Deverell decided to open a, a general store on Bag Square. Uh, it was very, very successful. You got to remember at that time, Utica was really a busy transportation center. Uh, pioneers heading from New England west um, uh, would often stop in Utica, spend two or three days uh, getting supplies before their trips west. And stores like, De in fact, John Deverell's store right on Bag Square was very successful. Um, nope, I'm ahead of myself here. Um, it was a, so it wasn't very long before he became a very wealthy man. They said that sales uh, by 1805 reached almost $100,000 a year. Now $100,000 in 1805, that's a lot of money. So again, John C. Deverell became a very, very wealthy man wealthy enough to be able to travel to Albany uh, most weekends to attend Mass at St. Mary's Church in Albany. Now, John C. Deverell was a devout Catholic, and there were no Catholic churches at the time 
west of Albany. A great majority of the Catholics in central and western uh, New York, including you know, Utica, had never been to Mass, never been to confession, had never seen a priest, uh, and they certainly could not afford, like John Devereux, to travel to Albany to, to go to Mass. Now eventually, Devereux became a member of the Board of Trustees at St. Mary's in Albany. And he began to complain loud and clear that something had to be done to accommodate the, uh, the Catholics in Central and Western New York. Now, a Devereux was, again, like Bishop Scalabrini, he was not only a talker, he was a, he was a doer. So he called a meeting of Catholics, some as far, far away as uh, Syracuse and Rochester, and they established the Catholic Church of the Western District of New York. It would build its first church in Utica. It would be called St. John's Church. It would be built on the southwest corner of John and Bleecker, on land, by the way, that was donated by an Episcopalian, Morris Miller. So the ecumenical movement was alive and well in Utica. Uh, and of course, as we know, the church still stands. And the year was 1819. So as a result, St. John's Church today in Utica is the mother church of all churches in the state west of Albany. St. John's right here in Utica. Now East Utica was settled quite a year, quite a few years after uh, West Utica and South Utica were, 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 uh, were settled. And St. John's Church, the parishioners there were instrumental in, uh, in forming St. Mary's Church on South Street in Utica for the German population in East Utica. And in the early 1890s, St. Agnes Church on Kasukta Ave and Blandina Street for the Irish population in East Utica. So it's not surprising that in the, by the mid-1880s uh, and 1890s, St. John's took a special interest in the fast-growing Italian population in East Utica. Now Monsignor Lynch, James Lynch, the rector of St. John's, brought in a Father Antonio Castelli, an Italian-speaking priest, at St. John's as his assistant to celebrate Mass for the Italians. Now for the first time um, in Utica, the Italian immigrants uh, could hear a sermon in the Italian language. Monsignor Lynch also gave the Italians who really wanted a church of their own. The use of an old church school, of, of an old school building on Catherine Street for a temporary uh, church. Now later, a group of parishioners at St. John's began to help the Italians raise funds to build a permanent church of their own. Now the St. John parishioners were led by, uh, uh, by uh, Monsignor Lynch and uh, a name I am sure you know, Cecilia Ropetti Kernan, who had an Italian background and married into the very influential Kernan family in, uh, in Utica. So on July 24th, 1895, the new St. Mary of Mount Carmel Church was incorporated with papers signed by Patrick Ludden, the Bishop of Syracuse, of Father John Kennedy, the Vicar General of Syracuse, Father Castelli, and two very of Mount Carmel's leading parishioners Antonio Sistai and Salvatore Pelletieri. Now, Father Castelli became Mar Carmel's first pastor. By the way, he died at age 74 uh, in, in 1903, and he's buried at St. Agnes Cemetery on, the, on the Mohawk Street. Now, St. Mary of Mar Carmel's second pastor was Father Joseph Formia who was born in Italy in 1874 and was the first Scalabrini father uh, at, to serve St. Mary of Mount Carmel Parish. So really it all began in 1819 when a man named John C. Deverell 
planted the seed that grew into St. John's Church. And St. John's Church planted the seed that grew into St. Mary of Mount Carmel. And that church today, St. Mary of Mount Carmel, Blessed Sacrament Parish, continues to serve a diverse population uh, made up of many ethnic backgrounds. So as I said at the beginning, I hope some parents today continue to name their sons John because the name is an important name in not only the history of the Catholic Church, but in the history of, of, of our parish. And I'm sure 25, 50, 100 years from now, I hope anyway, that members of our parish uh, will know about the Scalabrini Fathers and how they served our parish during its first 90 years of existence. Missionary priest founded by a man who is now a saint, St. John Giovanni Scalabrini, a blessed man who blessed and laid the cornerstone of the church building in which we now worship. And I'm sure 25, 50, 100 years from now, members of our parish and other Utigans, I hope, will honor the man who established the Catholic Church in Western and Central New York, and by doing so indirectly, help to establish today's St. Mary Mark Carmel Blessed Sacrament Parish, John C. Deverell. John C. Deverell, John Scalabrini, St. John Scalabrini, two men who always be, who always will be an important part of our parish history. And I thank you. That's it. By the way, just as an aside, I don't know if you noticed it, but if you ever drive along Broad Street, St. John Deverell lived on Broad Street in Second, and uh, he had a house there, and every so often, because no Catholics in this area had ever been to Mass, um, he, would, he would invite, believe it or not, uh, Protestant ministers to, on Sunday, to give a sermon in his house so Catholics could at least hear a man of the cloth speak. But then he convinced one of the priests at St. Mary's to say the first Mass in his house that was on Broad and Second. And if you drive along Broad Street today, I don't know if you noticed, there's a big boulder there, right on the curbside. And if you, of course the plaque is all rusty now, but it mentions that the first Catholic Mass west of Albany was celebrated on that site. The house is gone, but on John Devereaux's house on, uh, on Broad and Second. So, a lot of interesting history. That's it. Thank you, Frank, for all your uh, words about our parish and the history of our great city. So certainly thank you again for being here and sharing communion with us and, and breaking bread. So thank you. We certainly, on behalf of Rosemary Shippey, want to thank everybody that's here. It's so great to see so many of us gathered together. Uh, as Rosemary pointed out, uh, this started out as just a talk around her, her kitchen table some time ago and said, what do you think about we bring back a communion breakfast? And we said, Let, why not? Let's give it a try. So it is in its ninth year, and it's great to see so many people gather together. I always refer to us as a parish family. That's what we are as a family. And we could never withstand all these ups and downs that Frank mentioned, and good times and bad, without being a family. That's what it's all about and we're all there for one another in some way or shape or form, and I hope that that continues. You know, he mentioned a good thing about President McKinley, because I can remember uh, Father Joe mentioning at our, when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the blessing of the Cornerstone in um, 2001, how that was that year, and that September, was 9-11, and how in 1901 was the press the death of President McKinley. So, uh, two mar markers, and I, remember, I still remember Father Joe mentioning that at, the, at that celebration. So we certainly 
have had our, our moments in, in, in history, whether it's the world wars or any of the wars that our, our troops fought at, and just the hard times, and, and then the happy times too. So we have a lot, a lot to be proud of. And I couldn't be happier to be a, a, a member of this parish family, because uh, many of you have influenced me over the years, and I hope it continues, as Frank said. So, and we're fortunate that we have all three of our pastors since uh, the Scalabrini's left here with us today. Obviously, Father John, or Father Joe was here. I think he might still be here. I don't know. He left, okay. But Father John Rose is here, you know, and then Father Sesta. So we, we are very fortunate to still be going strong as we are as a parish family and for many years to come. And I hope the thing that uh, Frank mentioned that I worry about sometimes too is the fact that we don't forget about the Scalabrini Fathers. Certainly we're very blessed with the, our diocesan pastors, but the, uh, the faith that they passed on to us and the buildings and the hard work that they did when they were here, we really have to speak it up to, to our, our uh, future generations or that is gonna kinda fade away and we don't want that to happen. So people may not, the younger folks may not know what that bust is in the side niche in the church it's Bishop Scalabrini, and it's got to be something that we kind of remind them of and teach them about and how hard it was for them to get started. And here we are uh, well over 100 years later. So thank you again. Um, oh, the, an announcement, though, from the group. The, the, uh, if you're interested uh, in the centerpieces, uh, you can purchase those uh, for $12 uh, after the event is done. I think there will be a table set up somewhere. Uh, so feel free if you're interested in any one of those centerpieces. And just so you know, too, that the proceeds, not just from that, but, you know, anything that, that's remained from this event, uh, Mount Carmel Society has their Thanksgiving baskets coming up uh, that we sponsor, and we usually uh, help out, well, I don't know, half a dozen or so families uh, from the society and get meals for them. So that's where some of the proceeds go, as well as we have uh, it, uh, around Christmas time, the Abraham House we do something as, uh, for them as well. So, uh, like Frank said, this is one of the oldest societies in the parish, and we still keep it going. We may not be always visible to everybody, uh, but we still really are um, active as a group, and we still are trying to impact society as best that we can, not just our parish, but the greater community within the city of Utica. So, uh, just know that, and thank you. Um, after that, I think Carmel Ann wanted to say a few words, and Father Sesta, do you? I don't know if you want to duke it out with Carmel or... <laughs> okay, there you go. Thank you, John. You speak very sincere words as a parishioner. And thanks to Frank for your beautiful historical narrative. Very thorough and very well done. Very well done. Now, you only left out one historical note. Because Rosemary Schiffey's grandmother were there was there on September 15, 1901. And when you said they had a small group that got together after, I heard they went for coffee at Rosemary Schiffey's grandmother's house. She can't hear anyway, don't worry about it. Carmel Ann, come over, honey. Again, I want to thank you all for coming. This was very nice. We, after nine years, I still enjoy planning this and getting it all situated. And I hope everybody was happy with the food. Yeah. In the service, I thought it was good. The two things are, excuse me, I want to remind you, December 4th is going to be Breakfast with Santa, and it's going to be a, just a pancake breakfast. So make sure that with your grandkids or your kids that you get your tickets. And December 10th is going to be our Christmas gala. And that's going to be at the Delta at the Marriott. So please, get your tickets early. It's guaranteed to have a wonderful time. And we have Anthony the Barber again. And you know he's very, very entertaining. So hope to see you then. Thank you. On your way out, if you want to bring home some of these wonderful desserts that are laid off over here, feel free, you know. The Italian ladies, you got your pocketbook, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you can, you can watch, have some more desserts, watch the Golden Girls on TV. But really, get them, they're delicious. Bring some home.